Hi, uh, Peter Beal here, uh, doing this lecture for Art 1012. Uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is the artist Michelangelo Buonarroti, and I want to spend some time doing it uh, in the audio format uh, primarily because there's a great deal to cover, and it just may be simpler, I think, to record some of these thoughts uh, in voice form uh, and perhaps later address them also in, uh, in, in the text form. The, the reason I want to do this is because Michelangelo is a tremendous presence in Italian Renaissance art. Uh, it's really impossible uh, to overestimate uh, the degree to which uh, Michelangelo really uh, influenced uh, the history of art, especially in the 16th century and uh, really going even into the 17th century. And this is because, uh, first of all, he's very, very long-lived, very, very prolific, and uh, had a kind of stupendous intellectual presence as well as an artistic one. In other words, his, his work is rich both in aesthetic and uh, intellectual content and uh, for that reason it has to be taken, I think, very, very seriously. One of the ways in which we can begin the discussion of Michelangelo's art is really to think in terms of art theory and uh, we kind of want to focus perhaps on a key item of difference that he may have uh, had regard, say, to his contemporaries, such as Leonardo da Vinci. And this has primarily to do with what we might loosely describe as a strain or pattern of idealism uh, in his work. In other words, Michelangelo really puts a great deal of emphasis on the innate capacity of the artist to make something new uh, of the world. We base our ideas, as I think Michelangelo would argue, uh, on what we see in the world. There's, there's no question about that, and, and to a large degree he has that in common with Leonardo. But for him there's something more important, um, and indeed it can be summarized using the word idea, that there is something in the intellect of the artist that allows that artist to pick and choose and refine and change and emphasize according to his own innate capacity for judgment. And I think uh, that's that's quite important uh, to consider because what it ultimately does is steer the priority in the visual arts away from a more or less absolute version of nature and towards a m what might be described as a subjective one. In other words, the artist is in control of the outcome of the work of art to a degree that perhaps isn't really seen uh, before in the history of Italian art. Um, for instance, if we consider uh, the description in the text might be helpful for, for this, uh, uh, for explaining this. We have the art historian and biographer Giorgio Vasari quoting Michelangelo as declaring it was necessary to have compasses in the eye and not in the hand because the hands work and the eye judges. So the real work of the artist is not manual or technical in nature but is a much more nuanced and subtle process of, again, refinement of thought, of clarification, explication. And that what that meant was that in the end it was up to the artist to determine what was right. As the text continues, Michelangelo sets aside Vitruvius, Alberti, Leonardo, and others who looked for a, an absolute, a perfect measure, asserting the artist inspired, and again, innate, divinely uh, uh, induced, inspired judgment could identify other pleasing proportions. Not necessarily perfect, of course, but pleasing proportions. And the artist is not confined to an absolute vision of perfection or beauty, but instead focuses on something uh, we might say more in a more, more personal in, in, in a sense. And as the text rightly says, this shifts the priority away from the subject, away from the patron, away from absolute standards of beauty, and towards the emphasis on, this, on the importance of the subjectivity of the artist. So it's really quite uh, important uh, to see how Michelangelo marks a departure from the uh, theory set down such, uh, by, by individuals such as Alberti or expressed by the likes of you know, Brunelleschi, Masaccio, and what have you. Instead what m works for Michelangelo is this sense of an emotional and expressive intensity uh, that is highly subjective, uh, impossible to put a yardstick next to, that in a s very real way is intuited or felt rather than apprehended through uh, purely through the intellect. The text proposes the word terribilita, 
to convey uh, the sense of power and, and sometimes impending fury that Michelangelo's work uh, conveys. Uh, Michelangelo, uh, in terms of his life story, it's a quite a long one uh, from 1475 to 1564. And as a youth, uh, he spends his time in Florence, in part uh, working for the Medici. And uh, in the aftermath of the fall of the House of the Medici in 1494, their exile, which will be for quite a long time, uh, begins in a, a period of uh, quite a long departure from Florence, uh, and especially after the reaccession of the Medici in uh, 1513. He uh, really does not agree with the autocratic uh, political vision uh, that the Medici will put in place in Florence. We can begin the discussion of his actual work with the Pietà, which is now in St. Peter's, 1498 to 1500. And in the Pietà, we see some themes begin to emerge uh, immediately in Michelangelo's work. Uh, primarily, uh, we see extraordinary technical ability, a real virtuoso piece. Uh, and when we consider that it's the work of a, a young man in his, his 20s, it really stands out as a, as a precocious achievement. The other element, which is harder to describe objectively, but which I would definitely recommend that you begin to consider, is the degree of uh, a kind of relaxed intensity that's present, especially in the body of the dead Christ. That Michelangelo constantly opposes these forces of tension and relaxation in his work. So there's this collapsed body of Christ, and yet there's also this uh, aspect of a kind of tensed or clearly evident musculature. Um, and this is going to be uh, a, a recurring theme, I think, in the, the physiognomy of, of Michelangelo's sculptures. We have to remember that Michelangelo primarily thinks of himself as a sculptor. This is present uh, to a certain degree in perhaps uh, his most famous sculptural work, the David uh, in Florence, and this is a large and complex uh, work of art on many levels, and I'm not going to go in too much detail into the historical story, other than to point out that it was intended for the uh, exterior of the Florence Cathedral, and upon its completion uh, was uh, reused, uh, redistributed, really, in an act of politics. It went off uh, to um, the Palazzo della Signoria and becomes an emblem of Republican Florence. So right from the very beginning in Michelangelo's career in Florence, he's embroiled in the political currents uh, of the time. The David, of course, stands in contrast to Donatello's uh, more, shall we say, elegant and even effeminate depiction of the subject. And of course, it's much more massive. It gives the impression of something superhuman, something titanic, something that ironically becomes the giant that David uh, is supposed to be slaying, uh, Goliath. And of course David is presented to the uh, viewer in a relatively minimalist fashion. It's very hard to identify with any certainty that this is in fact the subject. The head of Goliath is missing. The only uh, sense we have of its being David is the presence of a sling. He's also shown entirely nude, and this is not uh, typical in representations of the subject, but helps in a sense, stave off definitive uh, interpretations or readings of this particular uh, statue. This, the actual structure itself is you know, a magnificent uh, rendition of the male body, but with a certain degree of uh, idiosyncrasy in terms of the proportions, that he is not uh, interested necessarily in providing that classical perfection but instead is willing to emphasize portions of the body uh, to make a deeper point. I draw your attention particularly to the hands of David. His feet are also a little bit uh, out, of, out of scale. So as the text rightly says, when we, when we see this uh, statue, we're looking at Michelangelo's priorities, very well illustrated, again, towering pent-up emotion. David is considering the situation ahead of him, you know, sizing up his opponent, wondering what his next course of action should be. A similar uh, climate of emotion is expressed in the Moses, uh, and this is uh, after the 
1513 restoration of the Medici where he is working uh, uh, in Rome. And it's an important uh, statue for a lot of uh, reasons. It's really the best remnant of the planned mausoleum of Julius II, who would be Michelangelo's really most important patron, a sort of single patron. It uh, really emphasizes or, or underlines that presence of the quality known as terribilita, as the wrathful Moses uh, turns, having received the Ten Commandments, turns and is clearly about to wreak some sort of vengeance upon the misbehaving Israelites. And yet, at the same time, as he turns, and, and we see this awesome musculature and power within um, uh, that figure, he also is strangely slumped over, uh, powerless, really, ultimately, to, to leave uh, uh, the, the seat that he's on. It's a really kind of uh, interesting paradox or contradiction within this uh, statue. It's hardly surprising to see m much of the same uh, tendency in the bound slave, uh, where a figure, again, hugely muscled figure, strains again with against what appears to be delicate lacy ribbons, right? The sense of of confinement and, and restriction is, is quite curious. And many art historians have considered that these may have some allegorical significance, particularly with the uh, difficulties, artistic difficulties of, of coaxing art out of inert matter like stone. Again, this, now that you have this sense of Michelangelo's style, the tomb of Giuliano de' Medici in Florence is a, a good instance, I think, of, of this uh, tendency here to present the viewer with an enigmatic, and contradictory uh, presentation of the human figure. We see especially see this in the figures of um, the figures of night and day who are twisted and recumbent and unable ultimately to, to leave their you know their position they're teetering on the uh, on the top of the uh, sarcophagus here and it may in fact be as the, as the text describes it and this is following I think the general scholarly consensus that it reflects this concept of neoplatonism the ascent of the spirit from the world of matter to a transcendent realm and in this lower level particularly with night and day we see uh, the, again that sense of tension and unresolved uh, thought and activity. Perhaps by far uh, the most important uh, production, at least in terms of, of size and really impact upon other artists that Michelangelo ever uh, uh, produced was the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And I'm not going to uh, spend too, too much time in, in, in terms of describing exactly what's going on in it other than a, a brief overview of the subject matter and some, some uh, common features and themes in it. Julius II sought to redecorate uh, the chapel that was built by Sixtus IV in the um, late 15th century, and he wanted to uh, give it a, a, a splendid and epic uh, uh, series of, of, of illustrations, if you will, and left it really up to Michelangelo in large part. The, the scholarly consensus is not uh, unanimous in terms of how much input uh, advisors, more learned advisors, may have had uh, in terms of the selection and, and mode of uh, depiction of these uh, uh, themes. Michelangelo essentially puts together this epic of creation coming from the very beginning of things, uh, you know, creating heaven and earth and, and so forth, forward uh, uh, in time to the uh, flood the, and the drunkenness of Noah. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the sequence, actual sequence of the paintings runs uh, backwards in time. In other words, he started, Michelangelo started in 1508 with the drunkenness of Noah and the flood. And increasingly over time, over the next four years, clearly finds his groove, as it were, in this painting and creates uh, scenes of incredible power and dynamism with fewer and fewer characters. A good example of this, uh, really right around the midway point, is, is obviously the creation of Adam, which uh, <coughs> reflects some of the themes that we've already seen in Michelangelo's art. Again, the somewhat languid figure with uh, very, very defined uh, sort of titanic musculature, but unable to move without this divine spark that's about to leap from God to the to the form of, of Adam.
the sense of sculptural uh, form in this uh, segment from the Sistine Seal on this panel is abundantly evident and indeed the reduction of the natural world to a uh, sort of grassy bank with some sky in the background is indicative of Michelangelo's tendency to look for the general and the ideal and explore the expressive possibilities of the human body there rather than in meticulous depiction of visual reality. We, we can't uh, devote uh, too much more time uh, to the uh, career of Michelangelo in this, in this course. That's really more of a appropriate for a, a more specific Renaissance, Italian Renaissance uh, course. But we can uh, close out, in, at least in terms of his painting in particular, close out our discussion of Michelangelo with a consideration of the Last Judgment. Uh, that is the altar wall, the Sistine Chapel, 1536 to 1541, where in the wake of the Protestant Reformation and the sack of Rome and the crisis that the church was encountering, we can see a shifting away from the optimism and a sense of unbounded uh, exploration in a sense uh, that we might encounter, for instance, with Raphael in the School of Athens or even in the Sistine Ceiling. And the Last Judgment, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that it reflects to some degree this new vision of humanity and this new uh, idea about the, the Catholic Church. It's a much more um, pessimistic uh, mood to the whole ensemble. Instead of this uh, d depiction or portrayal, I suppose, of, of human potential, uh, we are all in this uh, scene here, seen in this painting, seen as somewhat vulnerable despite, again, the musculature, despite the, the massive bodies that populate the, the fresco. We're all, in a sense, right on the edge, teetering uh, close enough to, you know, uh, to the demons whisking the, the souls of the damned off, off to hell. It's really a striking image um, and one that I, th I think does begin to reflect some important aspects of counter-reformation art, that is to say, art in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, especially after about 1530 or, or, or thereabouts when the uh, Catholic Church begins to respond to the challenges of Protestantism. And as we'll see when we think of the Council of Trent uh, and its effect, the Council of Trent meeting 1545 to 1563, begins to narrow much more uh, precisely acceptable, the bounds really of acceptable church art. And the Last Judgment is, in a sense, uh, a response to the Reformation and also a challenge to the church itself. And indeed, the church it itself finds this uh, particular scene uh, a little bit too much, uh, even censoring it, adding loincloths and, and things like that to make it more decorous. So Michelangelo is an extraordinarily powerful uh, figure in art. His ideas resonate across uh, all of Europe, really, in terms of uh, how people thought about art proved to be very, very influential, especially coming in to the new era of mannerism, which will be the subject for another uh, lecture.